So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Jerry Archibald. He, I believe he needs no introduction, but in case he does, he's also a partner, um, the founding, founding partner of our healthcare tax exempt team, and he is going to provide the political landscape and the federal and, and state concerns. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I want to first acknowledge that uh, everyone on the phone, uh, as we review the materials that we have today, I, I want to compliment uh, each of you and your respective staffs. As the parent of a resident at the Mayo Clinic for the last 10 months, as well as uh, our daughter being a nurse at Brigham and Women's Ch uh, Hospital in Boston, uh, I can uh, keenly appreciate, while I'm not a frontline worker, uh, all of you have been uh, dealing with what I'll describe here in the next 40 minutes as uh, an ongoing hurricane of undetermined length uh, in the midst of daily tornadoes that affect your uh, program and services each and every day. Uh, in the uh, disclaimer slide, if you will, which is uh, up on the screen, uh, next, next slide. There we go. In the disclaimer slide, I think it's important uh, here that you can read this. Obviously, the, we're basically at $4 trillion of healthcare expenditures in New York State based on our total GDP. But the last sentence here was most interesting. I did a presentation last October of 19, so a year ago, uh, before anybody thought about the pandemic. And uh, if you read that last sentence, uh, industry, industry, industry transformation will be driven by consumer choice, financial decision making, and an external force yet to be identified. Uh, little did I know uh, that there would be a COVID uh, pandemic, uh, but I do believe that many of you realize that the pandemic has accelerated transformation in healthcare, and many of the economists and the futurists say that the acceleration has been uh, in some cases for a period of 10 years. So in telehealth and telemedicine, uh, we just jumped forward 10 years uh, from where we were prior to March. Next slide. What I'd like to do is uh, give you a little bit of background here. I'm not a person that reads slides. I like to pick the uh, items that I think are of most interest to you from the perspective of, uh, if you will, supporting my uh, presentation and the uh, topics that I think are important for all of you to consider, and uh, some of them are listed here on uh, this slide. I think the most significant one with Amazon and Jeff, uh, Jeff Bezos being the uh, richest uh, U.S. citizen, as well as uh, Amazon being up in the uh, close to $2 trillion now in terms of market cap. Uh, those of you that remember the Sears catalog, uh, they had the paper version of uh, what the Amazon uh, website provides now back in 1893. So there's many examples here of game-changing events that have occurred, and I believe that uh, the pandemic is now prompting uh, that industry transformation that I have been predicting for the better part of 20 to 25 years. Uh, I probably was a little bit ahead of my time if it was 20, 25 years ago. Uh, by the way, I celebrate my 47th year in public accounting. I started December 26, 1973, uh, 13 years with Arthur Anderson, and uh, uh, 30 now 34 uh, years with uh, Bonadio. Uh, I also, for those of you that don't know me, drive about 30,000 miles a year in my car to various clients and meetings around the state and uh, throughout the Northeast. And in my spare time over the last 10 months, I've decided to be a volunteer Uber driver. So I've picked up uh, one uh, of these uh, cab driver hats for every month of the pandemic. And uh, it's now going to become a signature for me on a going forward basis. So please understand the source is, uh, once again, I'm trying to volunteer uh, to help people with transportation. Uh, the last bullet on this slide I think is particularly important. Uh, we don't have a lot of discussion going on during the pandemic about artificial intelligence, but uh, we are being told as CPAs that within three to five years, uh, the advancements in AI are going to fundamentally change how we perform services, that being audit, tax, and many of our consulting services. So I do believe that we cannot ignore in any discussion of industry transformation or impact of the pandemic, 
uh, the effect of AI, and I believe that uh, as we are, we're participating in a national group of CPA firms that are trying to plan for the introduction of the, uh, if you will, acceleration of the use of AI uh, in an AI environment, as you know, much like the last 10 months, uh, we will be able to do substantially all of our work remotely. Uh, we may never have to go to a client's office. Many of you have struggled with the issues of whether or not patients are willing to come either to your hospital or to your clinic sites, and I believe that that will, will not be something that will end uh, with the vaccination process that will go on in 2021. I think that will be a continuing issue, uh, perhaps forever, but certainly for the next uh, three to five years. Uh, next slide. So uh, I'm going to comment in the next 35 minutes on the presidential election, uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I'm, uh, I'm saying the election is over, uh, and I'll describe to you uh, what I think will happen as we go forward to January 20th. I want to discuss the New York State budget woes, which uh, I must say uh, the Healthcare Association of New York State and Chicanians do a much better job than maybe I can do. But since we don't have a 21-22 budget yet, uh, some of what I'm going to give you will be educated specula speculation based upon the 47 years that I've been in uh, to the tax-exempt world. Uh, what can we expect from additional federal stimulus? You have to have your phone on and you have to be Googling constantly to see what Nancy Pelosi, uh, Mnuchin, and uh, Mitch McConnell and President Trump are saying. But it looks like, uh, I don't know what happened in the last hour, but it looks like we're going to get something in the neighborhood of $900 billion uh, for this uh, lame duck Congress, uh, because they are talking about working through the Christmas holiday. Uh, we'll see whether that actually has to happen or not. But keep in mind, and I want to make this point, the $900 billion that they're talking about includes a $300 billion carryover from the unused portion of Paycheck Protection Program monies from uh, the CARES Act in March. So you want to realize that this, uh, if it's passed in the $900 billion form, uh, it really doesn't amount to $900 billion. It's a combination of carryover from the CARES Act, PPP, and uh, new initiatives. And of course, you know, the two big issues are state and uh, uh, county funding, which the Republicans are against, and uh, the liability protections for employers, which the Democrats are against. So uh, you all, as healthcare providers, uh, unfortunately are being put uh, in the middle as a uh, political football. Uh, there's no question that there should have been a stimulus bill passed after the HEROES Act was passed by the House back in uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, but it hasn't happened yet, and uh, we'll talk further in a minute about what I predict will happen between now and the uh, beginning of the uh, uh, Biden administration. And then uh, the strategic and scenario planning, some of the things that we've been advising our clients in the midst of the pandemic and, and thereafter. And then uh, I, I think you know over the last four years there's been some questioning going on about what is reality and whether or not there are alternate realities. Uh, I have my own version of reality patterned after Cosmo Kramer of the Seinfeld years and uh, give you 10 predictions and 10 observations that I've made that I think are important for not just those of you on the phone, but your management team uh, and your board uh, and your CEO. I have consistently said that in all PowerPoints that I do, I have to do them so that the people that are listening to the presentation can distribute this PowerPoint throughout their organization and do not exclude your board leadership because board leadership right now uh, are completely confused and rightfully so given what's happened over these last 10 months. Next slide. So uh, this is a little bit again tongue in cheek, but uh, who knows what's going to happen if uh, the Texas lawsuit gets before the Supreme Court. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we've got 8 million, 8 million more votes being provided for Biden than Trump, uh, but we've got 17 states and 106 members of Republicans in Congress that are supporting uh, the lawsuit of Texas to uh, go before the Supreme Court uh, to turn over the election results in those four swing states. 
Uh, I, uh, again, give that very, very little chance of success. I think the bigger issue here is the uh, well, who's going to control the Senate. Uh, two Georgia runoff elections on January 5th. And uh, interestingly enough, something that not a lot of people have talked about, if uh, that's a split, uh, one Democrat and one Republican, uh, that makes it 51-49. And I predict that one of the Republican senators, most likely Mitt Romney or Susan Collins, uh, will decide to declare that she's an independent and want to caucus with the Democrats uh, to put the Senate basically in a tie in Democratic control with Kamala Harris as the swing vote uh, for 50-50 ties. We'll see how that uh, happens uh, to turn out uh, once we get, it won't be January 5th that we'll know, it might be sometime before the inauguration, hopefully. So uh, I do believe that if my prediction of a 50-50 Senate or a Democratic-controlled Senate, uh, we are in the virtual peach orchard with respect to Schumer as the majority leader, uh, Biden is president, and obviously Biden and Dick Governor Cuomo have a much better relationship uh, than uh, President Trump and Cuomo have exhibited. Now, some of what I'm going to say to you today is going to sound like I know this uh, for sure. Uh, those of you that have listened to the Hamilton soundtrack or have been able to actually see the play, now that it's on Disney+, Plus, I would strongly recommend it. I saw it last week. Uh, I am never in the room where it happens. So as you listen to me for the next 30 minutes or so, be aware that uh, these are educated speculation and commentary on my part. Next slide. All right, so again, I'm not going to read this to you. This is for the benefit of those individuals you're going to forward this PowerPoint to. Uh, Governor Cuomo has mentioned uh, bankruptcy, not of New York State, but bankruptcy of uh, states and municipalities at least a half a dozen times in his daily press briefings over the last 10 months. And I think it's important that he has also asked for up to $78 billion in federal stimulus to cover uh, the years 21, 22, and 23. March 31, obviously, being the fiscal year end for the New York State. Uh, the last uh, request, as I saw, was $60 billion, $20 billion a year. And uh, just to be aware, in the bill that's being discussed right now and potentially passed, uh, if it does include state and local funding, it is only going to be $160 billion for the entire country. So we can forget about getting $60 billion out of $160 billion. Uh, that's allocated for the entire nation. Next slide. So uh, the Department of Budget projections, as uh, all of you have seen, uh, we were at $15 billion about six weeks ago. Governor Cuomo indicated that we would spend at least $5 billion by the end of the December and more and more through March 31. Uh, with the Thanksgiving and the Christmas surge that's occurring right now, and all of you are facing the, the impact and the dilemmas associated with those uh, COVID surges, uh, it is uh, very likely that we might exceed the $20 billion budget deficit even for this uh, fiscal year, March 31 to 21. So uh, the uh, process that we've seen so far uh, is Governor Cuomo indicating that the Medicaid program which is $80 billion out of our $175 billion state budget, uh, needs to be uh, cut. It's no longer under a 2% global cap. Uh, it now is going to be subject to eliminations of services and service eligibility, and I believe thresholds being established for who's entitled to what services. Uh, it is uh, definitely dire, and it will be dire for the next three years. So. The first foray that uh, came out back in August, uh, August 1st, was a 20% withhold for state-funded contracts. That was obviously not Medicaid, but 20% on state-funded contracts. He's also mentioned the fact that certain programs may have to be cut by 20%, and the Department of Health and Department of Budget are clearly in a uh, sticky wicket, if you will, with respect to trying to come up with anything that's going to be acceptable uh, to health and human service providers uh, for next fiscal year. But, uh, but belt tightening and trying to address some of the issues that uh, we're presenting to you today uh, will certainly uh, get you in a better position, we hope, uh, for purposes of getting to the other side. 
And again, I am uh, old enough to remember, some of you are not, that uh, New York City, nobody thought they'd ever file bankruptcy. But uh, look it up and you can see that 1975, the New York City bankruptcy really did upset the credit markets. And I believe that's something that could potentially happen here uh, if one of the uh, states that has been most impacted, Florida, Texas, Massachusetts, New York, and uh, California, uh, one of those states uh, filing bankruptcy or one of their or many of their counties going down that path uh, will create a, a major disruption in the markets. Even though the Fed, uh, keep in mind, the Fed has said that they are prepared to buy up any and all bonds that they need to buy up in order to keep the credit markets from freezing up. Next slide. So uh, in the 20 to 21 adopted budget, you know that Governor Cuomo has a quarterly reset. Uh, his next quarterly reset will be, I think, announced uh, either just before or just after, or maybe in connection with his release of the 21-22 budget. And uh, it is historic in that it did uh, essentially create for the first time a flexible budget for New York State uh, for a period of 12 months with Governor Cuomo having the major uh, influence in terms of changes. Uh, I do believe that there's going to be a, a Medicaid redesign team uh, part three that's going to be assessed or uh, established. Uh, MRT2, you'll remember, in the last week of March of this year uh, proposed about two and a half to three billion of cuts. Uh, estimates are that the MRT3 is going to be asked to identify five to ten billion of cuts uh, given the fact that we are in a $20 billion deficit and the uh, Medicaid spending is roughly half of our total uh, expenditures for the state budget, it's reasonable to say, well, if you've got a $20 billion budget and half of it's Medicaid, then half of uh, where the savings need to come from will have to come from the uh, Medicaid budget. Excuse me. Go ahead. So uh, just, uh, again, more information for your uh, boards and uh, the key element of this particular slide, all of you know that DISRIP ended uh, technically March 31 of 20. Uh, all of you also know that the 25 PPSs are in various stages of either wind out, uh, run down, or reestablishing themselves in a, a different forum other than uh, being able to assume that additional DISRIP funding will be received. Our, our application was thoroughly rejected for an extension back in February, so I think it's important that uh, everyone realize that within your respective regions, and believe me, uh, there's 13 down in the city and there's 12 upstate, uh, it is important for you to know in the regions in which you uh, geographically operate, you have to know uh, what the status is of your PPS, do they have remaining funds to distribute, what are they distributing them for, and how could you possibly perhaps access those funds uh, if you are eligible to uh, provide them with evidence. And again, the evidence that I would be looking for uh, these organizations to put forth are potentially preventable events. I think if you take your calendar 17, calendar 18, and calendar 19, admissions, readmissions, and uh, ER visits, uh, I believe that there are opportunities here for hospitals, health systems to collaborate with community-based providers and demonstrate not only to the state, uh, to the PPSs, as well as to the MCOs, that there are values there that can be achieved even in the midst of the pandemic and that you need to be paid for performance if you can reduce those amounts that you uh, demonstrate that were incurred in 17, 18, and 19. Obviously, 2020 is a wild card year, uh, very different down in New York City in the first eight months of the year. Now we've got the COVID pandemic surging in the Albany to Buffalo region. So it is a very, very difficult year to establish uh, any uh, meaningful impact on potentially preventable events given the COVID pandemic, but I still believe there is a story to be told there, and I believe the Department of Health, the Department of Budget, the Medicaid redesign team, the PPSs, and the MCOs all need to be hearing uh, what I've just said uh, in a collective voice from 
uh, hospitals, health systems, as well as from the FQHCs. Next slide. So uh, I talked about Medicaid Redesign Team Part 2, and uh, again, uh, I don't know that I've said this yet, but uh, I'll say it again if I have said it before. Even though Governor Cuomo has asked for $60 billion, I believe that uh, the maximum that is absolutely needed over the next three years is $50 billion. I'm sorry, not the maximum, rather the minimum. Uh, if we're going to go above 20, million, 20 billion for this year, and the pandemic lasts well into 2021, uh, who, who knows uh, whether or not we're going to exceed the 20 billion? But the revenue uh, sources of the state government, particularly with the negative impact of the Tax, tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that capped itemized deductions at $10,000 for state and local taxes, uh, you have uh, a veritable a plethora of uh, wealthy and upper income individuals who are uh, not just leaving New York City for Westchester County, uh, but retiring and moving to a no tax state like Florida, uh, Texas, and Arizona. So as that uh, demographic change continues, uh, you also need to be well aware of the impact that uh, those shifts in population may have on your particular geographic service area. Uh, in the FQ arena, because they're primarily focused on uh, the uh, migrant population, the rural populations, and individuals who would not be able to otherwise access care, I don't think that demographic change is anywhere near as serious or significant as it is for some of the hospitals and health systems, and particularly the community-based hospitals that uh, surround the major urban areas. And I mentioned MRT already, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is again a list for uh, your management team and your board members uh, to see uh, what we've had so far and what we're likely to see going forward. Uh, I do believe that uh, if we do pass a $900 billion stimulus bill uh, before lame duck expires, uh, that we are going to get up to two to two and a half trillion. So there'll be another one and a half trillion potentially in the first quarter of 2021. You're going to hear later uh, about uh, the projections or predictions related to HHS provider relief funds. Uh, most hospitals were not able to take advantage of PPP during the, due, due to the uh, 500 employee limit. Uh, FQHCs had uh, much more benefit from PPP and there will uh, be, in my opinion, a, a second bite at the apple here because of the 268 billion that's being carried over uh, from the CARES Act. So uh, we do have the potential. I never thought I'd see the bankruptcy of both New York City and the bankruptcy of one of the significant counties. I don't believe the state will declare bankruptcy, but I do believe that uh, some of our uh, urban areas and perhaps New York City once again uh, may be in a position where bankruptcy might be the only option going forward. Again, the wild cards, the last, uh, our stimulus, how much it's going to be between now and the uh, uh, inauguration or post-inauguration, uh, President Trump and whether he's even going to sign it. Uh, there's speculation that he's going to be looking for a quid pro quo. Uh, if he signs this stimulus bill, he wants something significant that protects him as well. Uh, so don't be surprised if the next week and a half uh, is uh, another continuation of our roller coaster ride. And then I've mentioned the control over the Senate, which uh, I, I just have this feeling it's going to be a 50-50 deadlock. Go ahead. Uh, this uh, particular slide, again, for the benefit of uh, the individuals that you work with, that your management team, the people you supervise, board members, etc., uh, this is a summary that uh, we have been maintaining basically since the CARES Act was passed. Uh, it has been updated, as you can see, as of the end of October. We will update it again uh, once the uh, next stimulus bill passes. But it's a nice one page, and I, I've suggested to many clients, and some of them have taken me up on it, uh, laminate this particular document and put it in front of your board members, uh, particularly your finance committee and executive committee members, so that they all have a good picture of just what you all are up against uh, with respect to 
they hear all about the stimulus funding, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, you, the hospitals, or you, the FQHCs, are receiving anywhere close to what is really necessary to address the uh, incremental costs associated with the pandemic. All right, in the next 15 minutes, strategic and scenario planning in the midst of a pandemic hurricane. Uh, I mentioned the daily tornadoes at the outset. I do believe that the state has made it quite clear, uh, particularly with the RFP that they put out back in February before COVID, where they wanted to reduce the number of uh, consumer-directed uh, PAP and uh, PAS providers, personal assistance providers from 700 to a number as low as 50 to 100, uh, that that's an indicator of their uh, now, again, an acceleration as a result of the pandemic. We cannot possibly oversee and monitor each and every organization that's been built up over the last 60 years in New York. We need regional delivery systems. And in fact, some of the commissioners at the state level have indicated that the state is going to be establishing uh, requirements for uh, certain thresholds of nonprofit health and human service providers to be operating in somewhere between three and five counties on a going forward basis. It's not going to happen next year. It's not going to happen the following year. But sometime in the next three to five years, your planning group needs to understand that if you are isolated in a specific county, uh, the state is going to be pushing you in the direction of joining regional delivery systems. Some of you already have in the form of IPA structures, but uh, keep in mind, we're now in a position where government is in crisis, and government in crisis is very, very dangerous for providers, uh, depending upon what they decide they need to do in order to rectify uh, the fiscal crisis that the state is in. The bullet down below that has four bullets underneath it, uh, I like to use metaphors of chairs and uh, three-legged stools. You've got a four-legged uh, chair here, and uh, the areas that are going to drive further consolidation and regionalization. Uh, and once AI hits, I don't think there's going to be too many small providers that are going to be afford technology sophistication. It's been a black hole for every decade since, since the 1980s, and it'll continue to be a black hole for uh, the next decade. Making sure we've got effective board and management leadership. We're going to talk about telehealth, telemedicine, and artificial intelligence, or telehealth and telemedicine uh, in another presentation after myself. And uh, it would go, uh, it should not be uh, without saying, uh, workforce recruit, recruitment, training, and retention is a crisis throughout New York State, exacerbated by the pandemic, and in my opinion, can only can only be rectified by the return to work of individuals who have retired at age 55 or 65 and are willing to return to work. We've already seen it in the healthcare industry. But the immigration policy of this uh, country has to change because we've got uh, virtually millions of jobs uh, that people that are citizens of the US do not want to do and won't do but immigrants will gladly do them in order to get a shot at the American dream. Next slide. All right, so on hospitals and health systems, again, not wanting to read this to you, but uh, the, the risk and challenges are listed here. And I think the last bullet uh, is uh, something that I haven't uh, really said yet. And uh, when I do say it to CEOs and CFOs, most of them uh, don't want to talk to me about that particular topic. Uh, but if you were to build a hospital or health system today, uh, I think that what they're building in Utica and what they built in Corning a few years ago is a vision into the future of what hospitals and uh, hospital facilities uh, will look like in the future and not what they look like today. But I do believe your board needs to understand in your existing footprint of geography, the amount of unused square footage as you moved many of your services outside of the uh, hospital facility grounds and into community-based settings. FQHCs uh, have done similarly in terms of establishing sites in under, underserved uh, service areas. So uh, space is not just a commercial real estate issue. It is a financing issue, and it is a occupancy cost issue uh, for virtually every health and human service provider, but particularly hospitals that have been around for the better part of uh, 80 to 100 years or more. Next slide. 
Uh, I mentioned long-term care facilities here because uh, I know many of you operate long-term care facilities in the health system arena, and I think this is also a preview to what uh, will happen in the future uh, in terms of Medicaid managed care, and that is the second bullet. Uh, Department of Health uh, virtually gave up on uh, Medicaid managed care, uh, MLTCs, for individuals who are residents in a uh, nursing facility. And uh, we now, August 1st and November 1st, went through a disenrollment campaign of NLTCs, uh, basically individuals in nursing homes that meet certain criteria, essentially deemed to be their final resting place, uh, are no longer considered to be uh, a valuable opportunity for a managed care model. Uh, I could have told them that 30 years ago, but nobody asked me. So, uh, it sounds good, uh, but it's difficult to implement for vulnerable populations. We're about ready to go into a managed care pro uh, process for the uh, developmentally disabled. We've already done the uh, long-term care population, and we're in various stages with respect to mental health, substance abuse, and child and family services. So, keep in mind what happened with the MLTCs, and be aware that there are risks associated with uh, even a transition to managed care not being the final step in the process. Uh, on the federally qualified health center side, uh, I haven't been on a call in the last six or eight months that hasn't talked about the dramatic negative impact of uh, changes being proposed to the 340B program. I use the word ravaging here because I think it's appropriate. Uh, much like PPS distributions to the hospitals over the last five years, uh, this uh, uh, decline in revenue associated with 340B is going to put uh, many of the FQs on the same fiscal uh, cliff, if you will, that uh, many of the hospitals are experiencing as a result of the sunsetting of DISRIP and the uh, incremental costs associated with the pandemic. So uh, the last bullet, uh, financial viability of community-based organizations needs to be shifted from government to public and private foundations, and they uh, need to replace uh, what I consider to be a somewhere between a 5 and 7% gap in revenue that used to come from the government, uh, has been coming in part from fundraising and investment income, but it is now a dramatic need for increased funding coming from the uh, private sector, and when I say that, uh, just know that the Bezos Foundation now has $38 billion. Mackenzie Bezos, after she divorced Beth, got $38 billion. She put $19 billion into the Bezos Family Foundation. Mother Cabrini Foundation has got three, three and a half billion in New York City. Uh, there are many, many more opportunities out there. You cannot continue to go to government and think that they're going to have the ability or the willingness. Uh, to provide additional supplementary funding. There will be opportunities. There's always opportunities to follow the money to the uh, bank, which is what Willie Sutton used to say, why he robbed banks. And I do believe there will be uh, many opportunities on the government side, but this gap that's going to exist is going to be, need to be uh, closed uh, by those providers that will be uh, continuing to be financially successful. Next slide. Uh, and then I also included OMH and OASIS because I do believe we're heading towards a convergence of CCDHCs, Comprehensive Community Behavioral Health Centers. That's a federal uh, project or a pilot program. And uh, the structure of CCDHCs, uh, while not exactly the same as FQs, I would say that uh, it's likely that CCDHC models and FQs will be affiliating or merging at some point in time over the next three to five years. Uh, the other areas on here, the only acronym you might may not have heard of yet is APM, Alternative Payment Methodologies. Uh, just be aware, uh, my first managed care contract was done in 1978, and uh, the uh, potentially preventable events were, uh, or those looking for reduction, were reducing admissions, reducing ER visits, and shifting as many inpatient facilities to an outpatient setting. Now we have that uh, replaced by readmissions. Go ahead. So uh, again, external factors to consider. Uh, I do believe that you should read the Manhattan Phelps uh, document that came out at the end of November regarding safe harbors, uh, regulations by HHS and the OIG 
that uh, do provide a stimulus and a safe harbor in favor of formally competing providers to work together in a collaborative basis under some form of value-based payment or alternative payment methodology. Uh, the fourth bullet here, the gentleman who has been designated as the HHS Cabinet Secretary, unfortunately has a history uh, of uh, being uh, active in the antitrust arena. Uh, I don't think that uh, the, the winds are blown in that direction right now, but they could be looking very different uh, two years from now into the Biden administration. And the last bullet I'll let you read, uh, it was just uh, last year at this same October seminar that Ian Morrison, who's a fascinating futurist, uh, referenced Becerra as uh, having an aging background and pursuing uh, antitrust actions. And of course, this is all in the context of this week, we've got uh, everybody piling on uh, the dismantling of Facebook. Go ahead. I won't give you my opinion on that one. Uh, again, uh, I think I've mentioned most of the, the uh, bullets on this slide, but I do think the one that I have not mentioned is the first one. Uh, I do believe there will need to be litigation by providers and provider associations because I do believe that there are discriminatory, discriminatory practices being employed uh, in the New York State budget, uh, paying uh, state employees and state operated facilities at a much higher rate than the voluntary sector. Uh, the third one about the legality of the state's rate methodologies. Uh, obviously, the long-term care facilities went through the uniform, uh, universal settlement a year or two ago. Uh, litigation can work, but it takes 10 to 15 years and one hell of a lot of money and one hell of a lot of risk. So I'll not suggest it as the first course of action. I think the last bullet there is what I would uh, be hoping would occur. Provider associations are going to need to go out on a limb and be more aggressive in their posture uh, with uh, respect to their interactions with uh, New York and federal legislators. Next one. Oh, and we have our first poll question, so I hope that you get a break. Is uh, I will launch it. What is the greatest risk or challenge to your organization? Uh, the is, my screen's a little small. The, you can see it there. The uncertainty of trans. Transition to BVP, government regulations, um, increased reliance on digital information, or other, or all of the above. And we have approximately about one minute to, to res uh, respond to this poll question. Again, this is for those that require CPE. There are no questions that have come in at this time. We have 30 seconds, and what I'll let Jerry get going again, I'll flip to the next slide, but I'll give the 30 seconds to close this out. Okay, I've got seven minutes here to get to 1220, and if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Uh, these are some questions that I think uh, are important for organizations in uh, addressing their strategic planning. Uh, both from a management perspective as well as from a board perspective. Uh, we've been talking about integrated delivery networks and systems since I joined uh, Arthur Anderson in the mid-70s, and uh, we haven't quite got there yet, but we are making progress. Uh, I will be long gone and six feet under uh, before we uh, actually reach the true IDN, uh, in my opinion, in uh, network uh, uh, for New York anyway. Uh, we've got some folks out on the left coast that have done far more than what we've done here. But when I talk about integrated delivery, it's uh, hospitals, physicians, community-based organizations, social determinants of health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and getting to that level of integration from a technology and a collaboration perspective uh, is still going to be elusive, at least for this coming decade. <clears throat> Next slide. So uh, the fact that Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and Chase have launched the Haven Initiative, uh, that's something that was, I think, the origin was uh, our friend Warren Buffett. You should take a look at that initiative. And I do believe that this external force, much like COVID being an external force, uh, the external force is going to functionally, functionally change healthcare service delivery will come from the outside. Uh, much like SpaceX with uh, Elon Musk, and there's uh, just example after example, 
that if we don't fix ourselves in terms of those current fragmented silos, we are uh, going to be, if you will, forced uh, to transform into someone else's vision of what makes the most sense in terms of integrated healthcare delivery. Uh, I did uh, give you my age by saying I was in for 47 years. I'm very disappointed that the notorious RBG uh, passed on, but I, I want everybody to know that I can't leave in this particular environment we find ourselves in. There's too much to do, and I've got too much to offer from 47 years of experience. So I'm on the RBG retirement program. Next slide. So again, we talked about uh, many of these that are here, and many of you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to talk uh, further about these uh, in the subsequent presentations. The bolded paragraph at the bottom, I think, is particularly interesting. Uh, I won't say all, but many. I don't even so. I don't even know if I should say most. Technology advancements in healthcare have resulted generally in incremental costs. And I used my first Hewlett Packard calculator that I bought in '74 for Arthur Anderson at 292. Did the same functions today for 50 bucks, uh, and that would be uh, basically 46 uh, years later. So keep that in mind as you move forward into the era of artificial intelligence and technology as well. Next slide. All right. Uh, more, more examples here, not necessarily important for us to review. You all are very well aware of it. The only comment I will make here is that if every American uh, on joint replacement gets uh, new shoulders, uh, new wrists, new hips, new knees, and new ankles, uh, we uh, will be functionally bankrupt as a country. So some sort of means testing is going to have to be adopted similar to uh, what is done in the other six, seven of the G8 countries, including Russia, uh, where uh, age plays a, plays a part in whether or not you get certain services or not. If you want a joint replacement for all of your joints and you can afford it, there is no country uh, on earth that I'm aware of, and I've been to five different of the G8 countries to look, research their uh, health systems. Every one of them has a sidebar parallel market known as either the private pay or the black market where you can get pretty much anything done if you've got the uh, money to pay for it. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, I, I pulled this because Haney's last year, they do it every year, set out their uh, 19 healthcare trends. And uh, I, th I thought it was interesting that there were, there were 19 uh, trends and uh, I think almost all of them that were listed in last year's uh, document would have been true 10, 20, or even 30 years ago. So, and I mentioned earlier that uh, the managed care contracts of the 70s and 80s, again, we didn't have the HMO Act until 1972, so managed care has been a developing arena ever since. And the 70s, 80s, and 90s have not been uh, too different from the 2000s yet in terms of uh, our focus areas on uh, trying to affect uh, both the lowest cost and most reasonable site of care. All right, we're gonna finish it up here with, I think the next one is, yes, Cosmo Kramer. Uh, you all remember the, those of you that are Seinfeld fans, remember the Cosmo Kramer re re reality tour that he did in a bus on one episode? And uh, again, these I am going to read to you because I think they are impactful and some of you are probably uh, moving in the direction of uh, wanting to listen to somebody else. So uh, again, uh, these are not necessarily going to come as a major, uh, if you will, uh, impact, but uh, the further down I go, the more impact you might feel. So smaller healthcare providers, remember my three to five county uh, commentary earlier. Again, I don't have that at first-hand knowledge, but uh, indications of the last 10 to 15 years make that quite clear. Uh, the study of bioethics uh, has to now be converted into some form of uh, impact on uh, healthcare. Again, I've got a son that's a resident, and I've got, coming back to U of R, by the way, as a fellow, and I've got the daughter in Boston, and uh, they have told me many, many, many times about uh, patients and costs that are being incurred that if they did not have uh, to follow, if you will, uh, blindly that Hippocratic oath, uh, we 
we've made some progress with hospice, palliative care, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, it has to come down to some form of uh, societal decision making, not Jerry Archibald looking at it from a number standpoint, but society has to understand that we can't continue on the pace that we are on in providing uh, what we are providing currently, or we have to figure out a way to do it more efficiently. That's particularly in both end of life and beginning of life care. Those where some significant dollars are being expended. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Okay, uh, needs testing. I've talked about that. And I, as I said, I've been in five of the G8 countries. I actually was in Russia as well. Uh, Russia, France, England, Spain, Port, uh, Cuba, etc. So uh, Canada, the U.S. Uh, so I've got a pretty long history here of seeing what other folks are doing. Uh, HFMA actually got me to three of those uh, countries for purposes of the HFMA exchange program. Uh, I'm forever grateful. Uh, five and six, I'm not sure what everybody thinks about that, but uh, I think the morphing of uh, providers into insurance companies and insurance companies into providers has some potential benefits. Uh, but it also has uh, some significant risks for abuse. Go ahead. And then the last, uh, oh, I'm sorry, last four. Uh, pharmacy, uh, we talked about 340B as it relates to FQs. Hospitals are impacted by that as well. Uh, we have to figure out a way to get uh, competitive with other uh, G7, G8 countries with respect to uh, pharmacy costs. And uh, eight is one that I'm uh, particularly concerned about. Uh, at Brigham and uh, Women's Hospital in Boston, they have a uh, uh, floor that they call uh, the penthouse, and uh, virtually everybody on that floor uh, comes in uh, from a foreign country, not during COVID, but uh, pre-COVID, and uh, those individuals uh, are treated to what you would describe a risk Carlton in a hospital. And I do believe that uh, one of the attractions of U.S. medicine will be drawing population and the wealthy populations uh, from uh, other countries while we are on a private pay basis usually, uh, while we continue to uh, have wealth disparity in the country where the top 10% uh, uh, controls, I believe, 42% of the wealth. Go ahead. Uh, talk about the PPS models. Uh, I'm hoping that we get some uh, movement uh, in the budgetary process to give some uh, further uh, dollars to continue some effort in the uh, DISRIP initiative. But I do think that uh, those of you that have felt that there always has to be competition in an urban area, and many of you may not think of Utica as an urban area, I do. Uh, St. Luke's and St. Eve's got together a few years ago along with Faxon, and you now are building one hospital in the Utica area in Oneida County. And I think it's important that uh, that may be the trend in uh, many other urban areas, uh, not only in New York, but throughout the country. And then again, the alternative to the, the lack of competition, if you will, between two large uh, health systems or three or four, you go to Houston, they've got, I think, 11 or something like that. Uh, it's not just Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany. It's uh, true throughout the country. The bigger you are, the more health systems you'll have. But I do believe that uh, forces number 10, which is what has already happened in many cases in upstate New York, where the community-based, uh, more rural hospitals and some of the smaller urban hospitals have uh, addressed the affiliation uh, process in order to uh, eliminate competitive inefficiencies and duplication of services. Is that it? Uh, the last one here, the last question, uh, these are questions that you need to uh, review in your own particular situation, but uh, I, I think you do run the risk of the IRS starting to tax uh, investment income of tax-exempt organizations more so than what they might already be doing. Uh, they already did it to the Blue Cross Association, which was historically nonprofit. Uh, they now pay a tax, those that haven't already converted to the public sector. Uh, but if we don't uh, show some major move forward here in terms of the ability of uh, the society and the providers and the insurers and government uh, to all work collaboratively together, uh, I do think that the, the government will take uh, 
more dollars from the industry and redeploy it in a way that they think is more appropriate. So, last question. We have uh, our second poll question. This one's a little lighter, but, but Jerry mentioned uh, Hamilton. So, A, the musical Hamilton, have you attended the Broadway show, watched the movie, what is Hamilton, or both A and B? I can say uh, neither for me, as I have been reading the provider release FAQ, but my children have watched it multiple times. And then, Jerry, we've had some questions come in, um, hoping you can spend about three to four minutes. Sure. Um, one of the questions, as you said it a few times, is please elaborate on your comment about needs testing. Is that means testing or clinical means, means testing? Uh, more clinical uh, needs testing, but also some uh, means testing as well. Uh, I think the thing that I've been uh, latched onto now for about 25 years is the QALY program, Quality Assessed Life Years. Uh, which is more of a clinical assessment, uh, or is a clinical assessment, developed by Harvard. It's been shot at, shot down, shot full of holes over the last 20 years. But I think they had the game right in terms of uh, managed care has created what the physicians that I worked with early in my career never wanted, and that was more cookbook medicine. If this is, presents itself, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, yes, the clinical pathways, clinical protocols that have been established by managed care are certainly and have been helpful and have been in many cases cost effective, uh, but I think that the uh, aging of the baby boom population of which I am a proud member, we cannot afford to take everybody born between 46 and 64 uh, and have the amount of services provided to our parents' generation provided to us. So let's do it in an organized planning way and let people know, uh, just like people are doubtful whether they're ever going to get their full amount of Social Security, let them know what are the rules going to be. If I'm 92 years old and my aunt got a hip at 92 and died six months later, is that an effective use of health care costs? Uh, I love my aunt. I wanted her to get whatever she wanted, and that's what most family members will say. But I do think that society has to get real with respect to establishing some form of clinical pathways that deal with not only beginning of life care, but also end of life care. And then in two minutes, uh, multifaceted question. Um, the, your discussion of artificial intelligence was interesting in integrated primary care behavioral health. Where do you see the greatest financial impact and where do you see the competition coming from and is it the technology companies? Okay, so first of all, on AI, uh, I do believe that the technology companies are going to drive uh, the change or the acceleration of change. Uh, I referred to telehealth and telemedicine uh, earlier as being pushed forward 10 years by the pandemic. Uh, again, we're being told three to five years for AI affecting the accounting profession. I think the technology companies are going to continue to drive that change. And from a cost perspective, uh, I believe that, uh, as I said, in the early years of new technology, uh, we end up paying for that research and development, much like we do with pharmaceuticals. On um, the integrated uh, uh, d uh, primary care and behavioral health, uh, that to me is uh, something that has to happen. And if it, it happens Monday throughout the state of New York, it would be uh, not too soon as far as I'm concerned. Uh, with this pandemic, we have seen obviously a significant impact on many, many individuals who have never even thought about mental health before or behavioral health. And it, it is a dynamic, this pandemic, that is going to change also the dynamic of how behavioral health providers work with primary care organizations. All right. We did have one more question. I saw it there, but uh, I'll share it with Jerry. So, so in the interest of time, we can move on to the provider relief fund considerations. And I'll be presenting that with, with Margaret Lally. Um, for those that do not know Margaret, um, she's become our in-house subject matter expert in provider relief funds. She, she checks the HHS website daily. She reviews multiple healthcare trade association websites. She understands what the concerns are. She understands what the comments are. Uh, she feeds and educates us 
us internally as well as helps us draft the, the external communications. So, so for the next half hour or so, Margaret and I are going to hopefully at least provide you with a basis of what the current vagaries and inconsistencies are in the provider release notices and FAQs. Um, it is important to remember this is where we are today on December 11th with what the FAQs and the notices are saying. So we're going to educate you on what are currently known facts, uh, on the currently known facts. So um, continuing Jerry's metaphor of trying to be in the hurricane. Well, when the hurricane hits landfall, traditionally tornadoes break out. So what, you're, what, what really landfall represents is your reporting requirement and most of your fiscal year ends coming at 1231. So the tornadoes are the uncertainty of what is the FAQ saying and why have they not provided clarity at this point. And your finance and accounting people are really struggling because they want to help you make, make decisions while you're in the, the eye of the storm. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Margaret to start, start the discussion. Hi. Um, I'm sure you guys have all um, seen several presentations on, on the Provider Relief Fund. So we kind of wanted to summarize all of the payments that have come out to date. But I'm not going to beat this to death since I'm sure a lot of you have already heard about a lot of these. I think they fall into two general categories, the general distributions and the targeted distributions. General distributions are supposed to provide providers with 2% of their patient revenue. Um, and these came out in three phases, uh, targeted at different uh, provider groups. And then the targeted funds are really going to places where COVID was hitting especially hard or where the finances of those types of providers meant that they really needed an infusion of cash. Um, one of the new things that has come out in the FAQ is the fact that for hospital systems, you are able to move general distribution funds between uh, subsidiary groups. So you can really target the money where you need it. The targeted distributions, however, need to stay with whatever entity got the fund. So the skilled nursing facility distributions, for example, need to stay with that skilled nursing facility. The other thing to point out here is that when we talk later about all of the reporting requirements, the skilled nursing facility infection control and performance-based distributions do have separate reporting requirements. So those are the funds that you got in August for your skilled nursing facilities, as well as the um, funds that are currently being distributed. So they have much more uh, specific expenses you can spend. So I would definitely look at the, the terms and conditions for those and make sure that you're separating out those expenses to cover the funds that you received in those um, targeted distributions. Next slide, please. Well, I guess we have a polling question. We, sorry about that. We have a polling question. I think it's good to, to ask this question right, right before uh, we, right after Margaret shared that detail and we get into some, some, some more of how the, the spending is. So I believe my organization will be able to spend all the provider relief funds we have received, A, yes, or B, no. And, and while that question is being answered, I'll, I'll let Margaret continue on uh, on the, the reporting timelines. So this is kind of a general slide that covers what the reporting requirements are going to be depending on how much money you received. Uh, if you got 10000 or less, you're off the hook. No reporting is required at all. You can just keep the money. Uh, if you got up to 500000 there's going to be aggregated reporting. So it's a lot more simple. Uh, John's going to go later into what those aggregated expense categories are. If you got more than 500000 there's going to be detailed expense reporting. And again, we'll kind of uh, go through that in the next couple of slides. And if you got more than 750000 you are going to be subject to single audit. However, that is based on what you spent in the, in the year. So if you can kind of split up the funds over uh, the calendar 2020 and calendar 2021 years, you may be able to kind of uh, get out of that requirement. I've also provided the key dates for you here. So uh, the reporting portal is supposed to open on January 15th. However, uh, given the fact that, you know, HRSA was supposed to conduct webinars and they were supposed to provide additional um, information on how to report. None of that has come out yet, so I'm skeptical that the, the January 15th deadline is going to be met by them. Um, every other deadline seems to have been extended, so I wouldn't be surprised if this one does as well. But as of right now, that portal will close on February 15th. So, um, you know, it, timing-wise, it's, it's going to be tough. You're, you're facing year-end audit, 
and a lot of other things going on. So if you haven't started to aggregate your expenses and, and kind of take a look at where you are, this is a really good time to do that. If you haven't spent all of the money by the end of the year, you do have until June 30th to spend it. And then there's going to be a second reporting uh, portal opened on July 31st uh, deadline to report on anything that you spent in 2021. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this either, but these are some additional uh, data points that they're going to ask for in the reporting portal. So things like, you know, your FTEs, your numbers of hired, uh, numbers of people that have been let go, um, admissions, visits, resident days, that kind of thing, as well as demographic information. They are going to ask for revenue um, by payer and also for the additional assistance that you've received related to COVID. So. All of these things are going to have to be um, compiled so that you can be prepared for those reporting requirements. Also good to note that for the reporting, they are going to ask for information quarterly. So that's going to be another thing that you're going to have to take into account when you start to prepare for the report. So this slide is kind of, um, you know, John was talking earlier about how uncertain everything is. And this kind of gives you an idea of just a few of the changes that have been made to the FAQ since it started. Um, you know, they've released this FAQ, and I think it's also important to note that a lot of times when they'll change something, they don't necessarily update the prior guidance in the FAQ. So you can't just search for a topic and find an answer and be confident necessarily that that is the final answer. There could be later um, updates that contradict it. Um, this has been one of the frustrations I know HFMA as well as a lot of other associations have reached out to HHS to express their frustration in the fact that things don't get updated. Also, there's other spots on the website, you know, the reporting requirements section, the floor provider section um, that provide additional information to supplement or also sometimes contradict. So you really have to look at the website as a whole. I would suggest that people have someone in their facility that spends some time looking at this or, you know, certainly reach out to us. We, we put in an awful lot of time trying to keep up to date on everything. The one thing that has not changed is the terms and conditions. So that should kind of be your guiding um, North Star, as it were, to uh, the use of funds. And I think John's going to talk about that in the next slide. Yes. As Margaret said, the, I like that term, the, the North Star. What we do know, and again, sticking to the currently known facts, is the terms and conditions have never stayed, have never changed. Um, what those terms and conditions are it, it, it is really that the money, when you retained it, whether or not you signed the attestation, you signed on to these terms and conditions. And they are that you will provide or have provided um, after January 31st, diagnosis, testing, or care for individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID-19. The provider relief fund payments will only be used to prevent, prepare, and respond to coronavirus or shall, re re shall reimburse you only for healthcare-related expenses or lost revenue. And the recipient certifies that they will not use the, the payments to reimburse expenses or lost revenue that have been reimbursed from other sources. As much as Margaret said, the, 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 you saw that timeline, it continues to change. It's up to 56 pages. I just printed it, have, have a big binder clip. You have to track it all. You can see those consistent themes are kept through um, are kept throughout the term um, throughout the FAQs. So, really, what, what occurred? I would say, well, the most significant change occurred on September 19th with a post payment notice. But what really everyone looks at is the October 22nd, 2020 post payment notice. At that point, what what occurred? was they created a two-step process for recognizing your provider relief funds. But again, do not shoot the messenger on this, on this two-step process. I can say if you go to the post payment notice, you'll see right at the bottom of the page, there are those two steps. And the second piece of it says, based on what you calculated in step one. So they are saying there's two steps. What I did when I thought about this and then we're presenting the slide today, there's really a step 1A, step 1B, and then you get to step, um, then you get to step two. So step 1A, First, calculate what your expenses are related to the, to, to the coronavirus, attributed to the coronavirus. Step 1B, what are, the reimburse, what are the reimbursement sources? And you can see right there, direct patient billing, commercial insurance, government payers, 
as well as some of the CARES Act funding and other grants you might apply. Then once you do that at step one, then you move to step two and you ask for lost revenue. And, and Margaret mentioned um, HFMA um, had some consternation. They actually on December 4th filed a letter or sent a letter to HHS. It's about 10 pages once you print, um, print it out saying you need to further clarify a lot of these terms. We're trying to do this two-step process, but that's pretty hard because your terms are, confu um, your terms are confusing. So what I'm gonna do is kind of walk through again what we know today and, and kind of what we pulled out is what the FAQ said at, one point, at a point in time and allows you to think about where we, where we are. So what are expenses attributed to the coronavirus? So, so it says it provides or provided care for individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID. So when you look at that May 6, the May 6 FAQ response, they broadly view every patient as a possible um, possible case of COVID, and not every possible case is a presumptive case. I know we have some folks who are closer to the clinical side, but I can tell you from Googling what possible versus presumptive means is that essentially all of us are, are, are really possible cases. That does broaden, broaden up what, uh, what, what the expenses are. Then you look at the post-payment reporting requirements that came out on October 22nd, and you can see that term in red, maintaining healthcare delivery capacity. That is causing a lot of consternation. And then what they did was they put et cetera on it. We got financial people, we got accountants. We like things black and white. We're trying to figure out maintaining healthcare delivery capacity, and then let's just finish it off with et cetera. What does that really mean to uh, what does that really mean to us? Um, we'll look at the next slide and, and what they did, a lot in this general and admin expenses where they said you can maintain your health care capacity and et cetera, they've listed out these various types of expenses. You can see mortgage, insurance, personnel, benefits, lease, utilities, and then they just decide to throw in another. When I look at that, that is very close to what your national expense classifications are or what your income statement looks like, um, what your income statement should be, should be looking like. So really getting to the next question is, so can I, can I really take all my general and admin expenses or is it just the incremental increase in general and administrative expenses? That is, is one of the key questions that's trying to be answered right now. And it's really based on the theory, well, if my general admin expenses went up, isn't that what lost revenue, remember my step two was supposed to cover? I don't want to be put in a position of double dipping. And on this slide, what you see is they first, in, in their response to the, the on, on 1028, the response to, to general expenses attributed to the coronavirus, is when they first start talking about this theory of incremental. So we went along with, with the post-payment notice on September 19th, on October 22nd, we said, okay, they're, they're putting G&A in there, they're, they're saying maintain facilities. I remember talking to Margaret between this time period, and we were looking at maintaining facilities and et cetera, kind of putting our hands up. And then they come out and they decide to put on October 28th incremental expenses, and we're just going, okay, well, that opens it up, that creates some, some consternation, and we really need clarification. Um, what we got next, though, that, that was, was talking about the G&A, then we got the healthcare-related expenses. That, those were defined on, on, in the post-payment notice on October 22nd and the follow-up um, FAQ on October 28th. Those define healthcare expenses. When Margaret and I talk about this, we're pretty comfortable with what your healthcare expenses are. And that's really kind of what we'll say is your direct cost related to COVID. You, you set up a testing site. You, you, you had... Unfortunately, you had to make a field hospital. You were doing more testing. You had to buy a vehicle to, 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 to transport tests. Those, we kind of say, those are directly related. That's us, healthcare expenses. That makes sense. That should be listed in, in, in your expenses. Um, and then what we did is, is kind of, we're, we're gonna look at what the reimbursement from other sources is because that's also creating some, some of the consternation um, what they talk about is the post-payment report uh, in the post-payment reporting re post-payment reporting requirements on October 22nd. They said what has been reimbursed by other sources, and they list out uh, FEMA, COVID claims, and the PPP program. The FAQ does clarify and says direct patient billing. So really, they're also saying what you would have been paid for through 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 filing an insurance claim. Um, so so what's coming in from the patients? what's coming from the commercial insurance, what's coming from, the, from, from Medicare and Medicaid, you also take that off of, of your expenses because that's re been reimbursed. And I know it's really small on the screen, 
but this is from, right directly from the FAQ. They're trying to make the point of incremental expenses, but what I think is interesting, and it's one of the themes we, we want to think about as we go through this, is can I have margin? If you were able to look at example three, they, they show an example of how the commercial insurance reimbursement, you were making margin prior to COVID off of your commercial insurance. Because expenses went up, you weren't making margin any, anymore. They said, well, when your incremental expenses went up, we understand you need to make margin off of commercial insurance. I, I also think that, you know, first of all, for, from, from provider relief funds, so the, the sticking point is you can make margin. It's okay. You don't have to break even to zero. And I think that opens up to a greater, greater um, topic of conversation is that HHS is right there acknowledging that you make margin off of commercial insurance and not, gov um, not governmental payers. So, so then, um, we, we, we then we're now we're into step two, which is your lost revenue attributed to coronavirus. This has changed multiple times. We, we went through the summer, and they said, use any reasonable method. And it said, compare it to last year. Compare it, if, if, you, don't have, if you don't feel comfortable last year, look, look, at, look at 2018. Look at your budget. And we got a lot of pushback saying, this seems a little bit too loosey-goosey. So on September 19th, they dropped the post-payment notice, and all of a sudden, it seemed like they tightened it up. They created a lot of confusion. They wanted you working back to that income. Margaret was running Excel simulations saying, there's no way this makes sense. Well, on October 22nd, they clarified that. And they said it's the difference between your calendar year of 2019 and, and 2020, your actual patient care revenue. And that's all sources of patient care. But you're going to take that net, um, you're going to take that net of your uncollectible patient service or, or what went to bad debts. It means your healthcare services, your, your, your supports in the medical community, your 340B. You're not including insurance, retail, real estate, um, grants or tuition. You exclude those. So just think about your, your, your patient care revenue. And if you do continue, as Margaret mentioned earlier on, what is your timeline? If you're going all the way out to June 30th and using 2021, you continue to use 2019 as your base. One of the very helpful FAQs is at the bottom of this slide, November 18th, 2020. We're very glad that they clarified that you're not taking the retro, um, retro adjustments. So what you are doing is you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Whole question number four is, is I take a little bit of a breather. Um, frequent, do you frequently, like Margaret, go to the Health and Human Services website and check for updates? Yes or no? And what we'll do is, I'll train, uh, Margaret and I are going to go through some of the frequently asked questions we receive on a regular basis from, from our clients. So Margaret will handle the, the first two questions. So the first question, can I use my provider relief funds for capital purchases? And this is a great example of one of the FAQs that has changed. Um, initially, they indicated that you could use it for capital purchases, but only for the depreciation for the year in question. Um, there was a lot of pushback. This is another great example of uh, the fact that advocacy has worked very well with HHS. If you have a problem with something, you know, reach out to your associations because they can advocate for you, and it has resulted in changes. So uh, on November 18th, they came out with a new FAQ saying that if the capital purchase is for specifically for something COVID-related, you can include the whole purchase price to apply against your PRF funds. Um, so we've got some examples here, and this is also, you know, a great way if you if you have too much provider relief fund and you don't think you're going to be able to spend it, this can be a great opportunity to invest in something that can be beneficial to you in the long run, telemedicine uh, infrastructure, for example, where you can tie it directly to COVID and so you can get the total cost covered, and yet um, you can use your, your provider relief funds that way. So I'm, I'm running the poll, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. There you go. So the next one we get a lot is, I'm a part of a healthcare system comprised of multiple entities that have attested to and received PRF payments by individual TIN. Does the PRF payment have to stay with the TIN that initially received it? Um, so for general distributions, the answer is no. Uh, they, they recently changed this FAQ as well to provide more flexibility to systems. And as long as, um, 
you know, uh, you can move general distribution money um, to whatever piece of your organization needs it the most. But that targeted money, as I said earlier, has to stay with the uh, tax ID number that it was targeted towards. One point um, that it still needs clarification, they, they refer to subsidiaries and parents, and we're not we're not totally sure, um, you know, what kind of affiliation structures they're including, so we could definitely use some clarification on that point as well. Okay. Can I use HHS funds for information technology upgrades, security enhance enhancements, security testing, et cetera? Well, this is not specifically addressed in the FAQs. We do see it a little bit in the healthcare-related expenses when they say if you need to purchase information technology. Um, as Jerry mentioned, uh, telehealth has been advanced by 10 years as a result of the pandemic. We're using more information technology. And as a result of that, um, as a result of that, using more information technology, and we're also preoccupied, we're, we're in that eye of the hurricane and these tornadoes are, are coming all over the place, you're very vulnerable to a hack. And right now in October 2020, HHS, the FBI, um, has stated that your cybersecurity is, is under attack and there is increased in, in, imminent cyber threats to hospitals. We, we've seen a hospital in New York State have to shut down. I believe the University of Vermont actually had to shut down because they, they got ransomware, but they ended up furloughing workers. And they're doing this in the, mid, uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So I, my belief is if you can document your linkage to the use of the HHS funds to information technology upgrades, security enhancements, testing, assessments, etc., you can document that linkage, you can use those provider relief funds for, for those purposes. And then how do I calculate lost revenue in the first year of operations? So I guess what a year to start. Um, but it's not necessarily just we started we started a practice this year from scratch and we built it up and had the pandemic. I think it, it, it's you had to create a new IN because EIN because you purchased the practice um, or you started up a new new service line that, that you had plans for and because of the pandemic it, it, it didn't really take take off. Um, we haven't seen the instructions of your FAQ's response specifically to this question. We did see in phase three in the add-on payment calculation that they discussed this, they acknowledged you could start up. So what Margaret and I have talked about it is you can use a reasonable method, probably using a similar size practice, a similar type of service line, even looking at what your budget might have said that you could have done, at least to come to some sort of basis of what your, what your expenses and lost revenue might have been had you not been impacted by COVID, and then what you can utilize as part of the provider relief fund. Margaret, back to you. So this question, I believe our organization was overpaid in error. What should we do? Again, this is another change. Uh, initially, the FAQ had said that if you thought you were overpaid, as long as you had revenue and expense to cover the, the money, you could keep it, um, which is kind of surprising. And they, and they did, in fact, update it right on December 4th. Um, if you do think you've been paid overpaid, you do need to contact that provider support line. We're not sure what's going to happen. I imagine that they are, they're going to want the money back. Uh, but before you do that, you, you might reach out to us. We can generally give you a pretty good idea of whether the money uh, that you got was correct or not. So uh, before contacting the provider support line, I would just take a double check at the money that you got to, to ensure that it really was an overpayment. Um, the next question, what does not reimbursed by another source mean? Is it only COVID-specific grants funding or all funding? Uh, this is another area that we really need a lot of clarification. Um, as John noted, you are allowed to make a profit. So they specifically put that in a policy paper that, that uh, providers are able to make a profit and potentially even be more profitable than last year. Uh, you do have to apply funds, including donations, if they're intended for COVID. Um, you also have to apply fundraising, grant money, and donations if they're um, used for patient care, generally speaking. So um, that was another new FAQ on, on December 4th. Uh, the one sticky point, too, is, is there's a whole discussion of cost-based reimbursement and how that works. So, you know, your critical access hospitals that are paid, paid based on their cost report, um, this is another area that could be extremely complicated to try to figure out and there's not a lot of guidance. Um, you know, just some of the issues that come up 
this reporting has to be done on a calendar year basis. And, you know, some hospitals have their cost reports that aren't on a calendar year basis. So, you know, that adds, adds a whole other layer of complexity. Um, generally speaking, though, you know, we, we discussed on, on the other slides what those other sources are. So I think uh, for most providers, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you're in one of these other situations, I would stay tuned and, and keep looking for those um, FAQs to be clarified. All right, what is the time period to use the provider relief funds? Um, I know Margaret said this earlier, but you would be surprised we do get this question a lot. And I think, I think it's a fair question because you are assessing how can we use these and we don't have clarification yet. Uh, Mar Margaret has, has continually told me that there's supposed to be a webinar and it seems like uh, we're gonna have a webinar tomorrow. It's just like free beer tomorrow. Tomorrow never seems to come. <laughs> So, um, but right now it is 12-31-2020 and you have an extension through June 30th, 2021. One thing to note, if you're going to step two with your lost revenue, um, you're not just taking your lost revenue and saying, well, April and May were my worst months, I used up all my lost revenue. That lost revenue is first, it's done quarterly, and then you look at, looked at the whole year. So if you started your revenue um, fortunately started going back up and you, you started actually gaining revenue in that calculation maybe towards the summer months, they're going to look at the whole year. If you extend that out to June 30th, you have to consider, geez, am, am I in a position where maybe my revenue in 2021, the first six months, is going to be greater than the first six months all the way going back to 2019? How could that impact, um, how, how could that impact my lost revenue calculation? So it's something, something to be thinking about. All right, can I use the provider relief funds and payroll protection program, FEMA and other CARES Act sources for the same expenses? And the focus is on not reimbursed, first you gotta focus on it's not reimbursed by another source and there's a risk of double dipping. So what I'm gonna do is we get this question and I guess I'm gonna be frank and it's really, what do you think? Do you really think you can use the payroll protection funds and the provider relief funds for the same expenses? Um, what some will come back to me and say, well, if I report this on 1231, but I never really applied for my PPP loan forgiveness to after the fact, you know, so, so it's not really, is it? And, and again, what will, really, do you think that was what, what the intent was? Margaret's already mentioned in her presentation in the reporting requirements, you're going to say I got a PPP loan, or I, or I got this source of COVID testing, so, or, or, or COVID testing adding. They're going to know that you received it, and they're going to ask, um, they're going to ask questions about it. So it's, I would say is start thinking about where could those double dip risks be and, and, make, and, and start, start analyzing it. We've seen the FEMA question right away. We saw the FEMA question a lot in April and May. It tended to die down, and then I saw it three times come up this week. Um, the, the issue with FEMA and the provider relief funds, and a lot of funds, is they say we're the payer of last resort. Well, not everybody can be the payer of last resort. Um, but I'm not going to use that and say, well, that doesn't mean just because you have provider relief funds, you shouldn't, pay, you, should, you shouldn't apply for FEMA. I mean, there, there's 60 of you here today. I can't, can't tell you whether you should or shouldn't without really having the facts or circumstances. But, but, you know, if there's cash available and you think there's an opportunity and you have the time and resources and you can calculate what the ROI is and the risk of applying, you know, those are items that, that your organization um, has to weigh if you're looking and saying, can I have FEMA and, and provider relief funds? And then, then lastly, the last question is, my provider, my organization will need provider relief funds and access what I believe I can identify in expenses and lost revenue, what should we do? So at the beginning of this presentation, we took the poll and we said, how many of you believe you're going to spend all of your funds? 30, uh, 33 responses, only, 10 per, or actually 30 of you of those 33 responses said yes. Three said no. I'd be curious if I ran that same poll if we, we'd have a different, um, we, we'd have a difference in, in opinion right now. But if you are in that position where you believe that you received more funding than you could spend, and those are some of the folks, so some of our hospitals and FQs that receive PPP and provide relief in, in other sources, you might be in that position. So what, you know, you gotta think about what the certainties are. We're here at the December 11th. We know we have through June 30th, 2021. We know what the accounting rules are going to dictate. Karen, Bettina, and Amy are going to cover those a little bit later in the, in the breakout sessions, but we know what those are. 
But what is uncertain? We have a new presidential administration. I, I, when I looked at this last night, I didn't mean it was uncertain that we're going to have a new presidential administration. I meant it's uncertain who's going to be part of that new presidential administration. Um, Jerry mentioned we'll have a new Secretary of Health and Human Services and other cabinet positions. So it'll be interesting to know what their position is on these provider relief funds and these FAQs and where it's going. And then the results of the Senate and how they can inform the administration on, on what they think. So, so what I say is you use the benefit of time. And, and really, I kind of break it down to, 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 to three things in these uncertainties. And control what you can, control what you can. You know, figure out where, you know, one, figure out where the information is. Two, actually read that information and, and learn it. And then three, think about what the concepts are in there. Going all the way back to when I first started presenting on this, I said really the key concepts have not changed. Start thinking about what those key concepts are and where your organization um, where, where your organization is today. I did see I have one polling, uh, not polling, excuse me, one chat question come in. Um, I will address that because it is a little bit of a, a technical question. I'll address that offline. But what we're going to do is we're going to move on in the interest of time to the um, impact of 2020 on telehealth and compliance. And Jerry's already kind of laid that out as we're switching over the presenters to, to Evelyn Magdalene. Sorry, excuse me, but Mag Magdaleno and Paula Santiago, and they'll, they'll be talking for the next 45 minutes on, on telehealth and compliance. So, did we pass the presentation baton? And if I can see them come up on the video screen, Evelyn, your video is not on yet. So, your headset, there you are. All right, and there's Paula. All right, thank you very much. Hello. There you go. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Paula Santiago and I am from Beacon Solutions Group and I am going to start off our presentation today. Next slide, please. Hmm. Uh, John, oh, there we go. So, wow, what a year we've already had. I'm sure um, as you guys have, are feeling the same way as I am, that um, this year has flown by, but also has given us so much information that our heads are kind of spinning. But today I'm going to help you to identify the CPT, ICD-10, and modifiers that are specific to telehealth. We're going to talk a little bit about the best practices for billing and also the documentation requirements for supporting telehealth to make sure that you actually get to keep that reimbursement that you've already received. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so we have some CPTs that are new and some that are pre-existing, but um, the pre-existing ones have actually come with some further guidance um, due to the fact that telehealth has become such a need in 2020. As we dive deeper into the billing best practices, we will look at some of these codes just a little bit closer, but please keep in mind that each care's guidelines for coverage may be a little bit different, so make sure that you're following those care guidelines. For example, Medicare has indicated that physicians and MPPs can bill for the telephone visits and digital EMs, but they can um, only, sorry, but then they also have specific codes for telephone and e-visits that are not billable by a physician and can only be billed by an NPPS. Next slide. All right, so um, one of the things that uh, we need to keep in mind is that the difference between an originating site and also with our distance sites, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, but keep in mind that most of our CPTs have um, remained the same. So whatever services you would be billing for a face-to-face -face service, you would still bill that in a telehealth service, unless it's one of these new e and &M, e m codes, the digital e-visits, or the telephone services. Next slide. All right, so there's been numerous new e &M code, or sorry, numerous new codes established for COVID-related services. For the most part, CPTs for COVID are based on exactly what service you're providing. But if the physician or qualified health professional 
dissecting the patient and then the swab is sent to an outside laboratory, you can bill for that swabbing. But on the flip side of that, if the test is performed in the office, then the evaluation management code is the only thing that's billable because the actual collection of it is included in that office visit reimbursement that you're receiving. receiving. One thing that is different is that if your facility is considered a testing site, Medicare has allowed for billing of a 99211 for that minimal assessment um, and the swabbing that you're performing. But again, keep in mind that that may not be relevant for other payers, so you want to check with your local payers. Next slide. All right, we have our first polling, hey, polling question. That I will pull. Yep. All right. Um, if a patient has an office visit, uh, ENAM assessment, you can still charge 99000 for the swab. True or false? All right, so while you are going through that polling question, um, I'm going to talk about ICD-10. So one good thing is ICD-10 codes for telehealth are exactly the same, regardless if you're doing a face-to-face -face service or if they're for telehealth services. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that whatever diagnosis you were using pre-public health emergency, if the patient still has that condition, that's the same diagnosis that's going to be billed. There are many new COVID-related diagnoses, though, that are used depending on the reason for the COVID-related service. Most of them are status codes, and it's dependent on whether or not there's exposure or whether or not they're asymptomatic. But one thing to note is that in most outpatient settings, um, you know that a definitive diagnosis should only be coded if it truly is definitive. So if it's probable or suspected or most likely, it doesn't get coded. The signs and symptoms get coded. However, the um, new COVID-19 code, U07.1, does clearly indicate in the ICD-10 official guidelines that this code can be used regardless if there's a positive test, as long as the provider has documented that they believe the patient has COVID. Next slide. All right, so modifiers. Modifiers are one of the things that um, has related, sorry, one of the things that has resulted in many denials as it relates to telehealth. So there's many modifiers that would be relevant to telehealth. The first one is your modifier 95. And if you actually look in the CPT manual under Appendix P, it indicates all of the CPT codes that can be billed with modifier 95. If your code that you're billing for is not in that list, then you should be billing with a GT modifier unless you're billing the asynchronous telemedicine, then you would use the GQ. Remember those services that are inherent telemedicine, such as your telephone visits and your e-visits, they don't require a modifier for telehealth because they already know that they're a telehealth service. Modifier CS is for those evaluation and management services where the assessment is related to COVID-19, and this will actually waive the patient responsibility for the patient. Next slide. All right. So let's talk about some of those billing best practices. So one of the most important best practices that I guess I can stress is I'm working with many different facilities on denials that they're receiving as it relates to telehealth is that making sure if your system is capable of automating any of the telehealth procedure codes and modifier combinations, either through a new visit type or a specific template, you should make sure that you implement those because with any manual intervention, and it has a greater risk of error. It's got that human factor in there. Um, place of service two, we all probably scrambled at the beginning of this year because we all know that telemedicine is usually always billed with a place of service two. And then we realized we started getting denials because it wasn't working out, because it wasn't on our contract. We're not a provider that's able to bill two. Well, then they came up with some guidance and said, wait, 
if the telehealth service is being billed as part of the public health emergency, place of service two is not relevant. So during the public health emergency, you need to bill the place of services type of bill that you would normally bill for a face-to-face -face visit. And the modifier is actually what will generate that telehealth payment and let the payer know that it's telehealth. You also want to make sure, again, as we talked about before, the differences between originating site and what's a distance site, and also make sure that you know those providers that are allowed to do the liver telehealth services, because there are some providers that cannot. One great thing is that Medicare has actually expanded the list and made it permanent of those providers that are now allowed to deliver telehealth services. Some of those providers are now physical therapists. Those were not allowed to bill telehealth services previously, and now part of the final rule is they are allowed to bill telehealth services. You also want to keep in mind that um, take a look at your EOB because remember that the payers are only good as the system that was set up to process their claims. So if somebody didn't set something up correctly, it's not going to work correctly. You want to make sure that if a service was billed with that CS modifier indicating that it really was a COVID related assessment or service, that the patient was actually, the patient responsibility was actually waived. If not, you've got to actually have a conversation or an email with your payer rep so that they can um, reprocess that claim correctly and waive that coinsurance, copay, or deductible. Most payers have actually indicated that it is the provider's responsibility to let them know if the claims aren't processing correctly. They will not be running system reports to see any services that were not paid correctly. Next slide. All right, so I wanted to make sure because it is fresh off the press, December 2nd, Medicare has um, released its final rule. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that Medicare has made some telehealth services that were previously only allowed during the public health emergency, they've now made those permanent. So all services in category one and category two are now considered permanent. And all those services that are in category three are still considered temporary. And those category three services that are considered temporarily are only allowed through the calendar year in which the public health emergency ends. So one thing to keep in mind is that if you go out to the Medicare website, the CMS website, and you look up the telehealth services, you will see category one, category two, category three, and it will indicate to you which services are able to be billed regardless of whether or not we're in a public health emergency. If you are a facility that would like to continue telehealth services after the public health emergency is over, I advise that you take a few minutes and take a look at that. And if you need any assistance, you just let us know and we can help you get that all set up. Next slide. All right, polling question, polling question number six, Medicare, extended some health, telehealth services permanently. Which category is still temporary? So let's see who is paying attention. Category one, two, or three. All right, so as we talked about, there are some um, code specific rules that Medicare has put in the final rule for virtual check-in services and online e-visits. These include the um, service can only be performed when it's an established patient, meaning a new patient cannot have these virtual check-in services and online e-visits, but they can be done with a broader range of communication methods. So it doesn't mean that you have to have actual telemedicine. They can be done, those virtual check-ins and online e-visits, can be done through your EMR if your EMR has that capability. Um, they also cannot be conducted if they are originating from a related E&M service that was performed over the previous seven days. And again, they must be initiated by the patient, which is completely different than a telehealth service, which a provider can initiate. 
I also wanted to share um, that the billing rules for RHCs um, are different depending on the time period that you're billing for. Keep in mind that these are based on date of service, not billing date. Okay, next slide. This slide provides you with some billing rules that are specific to FQHCs. Again, keep in mind that they are based on the date of service, not the billing date. It's also important to note for the FQHCs that you should have gone from billing three codes to one code as of Jan July 1st. So if you have not, you might be receiving some denials and you should look into that further. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so we all know that statement. If it isn't documented, it didn't happen. Documentation is always key. Good news is, is most of the documentation for telehealth remains exactly the same as a face-to-face -face visit, with just a few additional requirements. Some of those requirements are a statement that the service was actually provided via telehealth. Again, that's a good one to make sure is in your template so the providers don't have to think about it. It also must indicate that where the location of the patient as well as the location of the provider are. And it should list the names and roles of any other individuals who participated in that telehealth service. Next slide. All right, so we all know Medicare is really big on supporting medical necessity, and that's no different during these telehealth services. So supporting your medical necessity during the telehealth services is critical, and Medicare has provided some clear guidelines on how to support that medical necessity. Keep in mind, if these items are not found in the documentation, it will not support the medical necessity of the service. And even though you may have already been paid for it, you're not going to be able to keep that money if the medical record is audited. Next slide. One additional thing that I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of is that Medicare has made an update on um, it now allowing for direct supervision of clinicians through telemedicine services, as long as it's done through real-time interactive audio or video technology. It can't be done through a telephone. And as of right now, this is one service that Medicare is still making a temporary change on, and it's only allowed through the calendar year in which the public health emergency ends. Okay, so what that means is that if you are Billing for a service as a incident two, both providers can be on telemedicine on the telehealth service, and you can bill for that direct supervision of the clinician through that telemedicine service as long as they're both on real-time interactive audio or video technology. All right, now I'm going to turn this over to Evelyn. Great. Thank you, Paula. Um, so, hello everyone, it's, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, uh, today I'll be covering basically two, er two areas. Uh, one, what to expect during a telehealth audit, um, and the second thing is, is just a quick update um, about the recent compliance program changes. Um, I, uh, I work in with the uh, Bonadio Compliance Solutions Group, um, and uh, what we do know is that the, the use of telehealth uh, to provide healthcare services is not a new concept. Um, however, since the public health emergency, the use of telehealth has exponentially increased, and what is allowable has changed under uh, the 1135 waiver, uh, which has expanded telehealth services uh, such as paying for um, office and hospital and other medical services, as Ms. Paula eloquently pointed out, um, you know, in, in services well beyond just rural areas. Uh, and, and uh, of course, allowing uh, services to be provided in a patient's home. And as I mentioned, telehealth has been around for a number of years, um, so I think it's, it's helpful to look at what has been identified as problematic areas um, during uh, previous telehealth audits. Um, so service documentation um, doesn't support the claim. Um, Paula stated that documentation is the key. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so you know, making certain that the full um, service is documented 
um, and, and contained in, in the record. Um, all of the review of systems, if, if you're providing um, a particular type of service, is included in your documentation. Um, a provider who's not authorized to provide the telehealth service um, is another area that has been um, seen as a problem uh, as a problem area. Failing to demonstrate uh, that the patient provided consent to provide the service via, via telehealth. Uh, I recently participated in my brother's uh, cardiology appointment via telehealth, and one of the first things that the doctor at, uh, went over was the fact that this was a telehealth service, also asked for his consent, in, inquired as to who I was and what my relation is to the patient, and so all of that was documented even before the service began. Um, another uh, audit issue identified was using uh, a platform that, that's not secure or not, not approved, um, did not use a non-public facing uh, remote communication product. Um, and some of the ones that are uh, approved now that, that were named in, in some of the communication that came out this year is Apple FaceTime, Google Hangouts, um, uh, Google Hangout Video, Zoom, Skype, so, so some of the, just some of the things that are uh, approved, be, which are encrypted and allow for only the patient and the healthcare provider to view what's being transmitted. Um, public facing products such as uh, Facebook Live or TikTok or other uh, public chat, chat rooms are, are, not, uh, are not allowed. Um, there were two examples um, where providers ran into issues when delivering telehealth services. Um, one provider allegedly submitted telehealth claims for work that he conducted um, purely via telephone. Um, this is prior to the recent change that Paula just described regarding certain allowable telephone visits via telehealth. Um, another physician um, allegedly wrote scripts for durable medical equipment um, supplies which were not medically necessary. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the COVID compliance risks are just some key areas that we, that we want to focus on, keeping in mind that there are many more service types as well as increased scope of providers who are now eligible to provide telehealth services. Um, so in addition, there are different forms of, of telehealth uh, which, which were enabled, um, such as uh, physical evaluations via audio only. Um, incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the home and community-based services, um, you know, particularly day habilitation uh, programs for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, the direct service uh, professionals who are providing services um, via, you know, um, virtual classrooms are, are able to, um, to provide services uh, and, and get reimbursed via Medicaid for those services. Also, Medicare conditions of participations have been relaxed, you know, as Paula pointed out as well. Um, so all of these become potential risk areas and are sort of identified as areas for heightened scrutiny, um, you know, on the part of regulators and uh, survey teams. Next slide, please. So, I, you know, I pulled this up, uh, the 2018 um, OIG report on CMS Medicare claims, just to, to really just uh, simply wanted to point out a comment stated within that 2018 report. Uh, where they found that 31 out of 100 paid claims didn't meet the requirements for reimbursement. Um, and, you know, in addition, in that summary, OIG estimated that there are about $3.7 million in overpayment for telehealth services, just in, in this one area. Um, and so one of the three recommendations that, o, that uh, OIG made to CMS, and I, I sort of highlighted in bold, um, was to conduct periodic post-payment reviews so the point is that telehealth services um, continues to be on their radar. I think we have a poll question. All right, the seventh poll question. To, pre to prepare for an audit, focus only on the service documentation in support of the claim. True or false? Okay, and that it would be false. <laughs> um, so audit readiness. So what do we need to do uh, to ensure that uh, we are prepared? Um, 
in, in addition to some of the, the points that um, Paula shared, just wanted to give some, some tips on audit readiness. And essentially, you can turn any one of these uh, into a question and sort of create your own audit checklist, audit readiness checklist. Um, so let's just run through some of these. Does the service provided qualify as a covered telehealth service? Um, Paula mentioned that there was a listing of uh, Medicare-approved telehealth services. I, I, when I last checked, there were about 252 of them, um, uh, Medicare-approved telehealth services for COVID, you know, for uh, the uh, um, public health uh, emergency. Um, and some are allowable as audio only, as, as was mentioned. Um, like psychoanalysis, family psychotherapy, evaluation and speech production, tobacco use counsel, just to name a few of them. Um, so another thing to check, check with the insurance carrier to see what is allowable. Um, various insurance carriers you will, you know, allow you know, some things and not allow others. Um, is the provider approved to provide that telehealth service? Is the provider licensed to, uh, to provide that telehealth service? you know, um, depending on your the, your state requirements. Um, did the provider operate within his or her scope um, of practice in delivering that telehealth uh, service? Is the provider on the exclusion provider list? Um, I know of agencies who check that exclusion uh, provider list upon hire and then monthly thereafter. And there are some agencies who report that they will check it upon hire and then sort of infrequently check throughout the year, maybe once a quarter. I remember one agency telling me, oh, yeah, sure, we do the upon hire, absolutely. And then, of course, every year after that. Problem with that is you're really opening yourself up to risk because the month after you're checking on the anniversary date, you're opening yourself up of potentially having 11 months of someone being on the ex exclusion list. And, again, of course, all of those services provided by that provider will not be allowable. Uh, was there proper consent for the use of telehealth services and is that documented for every visit? Um, and is the correct location you know, documented in, in, the, in the service documentation? Next slide. Um, so just some additional audit readiness tips. Um, does the service documentation meet all the requirements to support the claim? So is the service type uh, supported by the documentation? Surveyors are also looking at um, the amount of time that typically uh, that it typically takes to provide that particular service. So they're looking for those anomalies when they're looking and, and reviewing uh, the, some of the service documentation. Um, is medical necessity well documented in, in the um, in, in the telehealth during the telehealth visit? Um, and for those of you who are referring physicians of uh, durable medical equipment supplies, um, you may be asked for your documentation in support of uh, the claim, more so regarding medical necessity. Was that GMA supply really medically needed? Can you demonstrate that your providers and clinicians have been trained on telemedicine uh, requirements? Um, it's one of the recommendations that uh, OIG made to CMS in an earlier slide. Are you using an approved, authorized interactive telecommunication system? Um, by the way, the, the Office of Civil Rights um, also issued a frequently asked question and on telehealth and HIPAA during you know, COVID-19 public health emergency, and o OCR cautioned um, that certain payers, and I'm quoting, include Medicare and Medicaid may impose restrictions on the types of technologies that can be used. Um, Next slide. Okay, um, I, I've included this just to sort of remind folks to you know, period, periodically check the OIG work plan. Of course, also check the OMIG work plan. Um, there are updates and changes that are posted online frequently. Um, and if you haven't already, sign up for some of the various listservs um, and stay informed you know, with your provider or, or, uh, associations. Um, and and they're, because they're also a good source of information. Uh, next slide. Next, we'll take a look at some of the compliance program changes. Um, so I just wanted to give you just briefly sort of a, a, an overview of what the history of COPA compliance, um, you know, over the past couple of years. 
Um, you know, the slide simply just to give you an overview of changes since 1997 when clinical laboratories first put in place a compliance plan to ensure, you know, proper use of funding. And of course, in 2006, the Deficit Reduction Act, you know, requirements kicked in. Nursing homes were then required to adopt and maintain compliance programs. And then recently, the long-term care facilities um, in, in 2019. Um, and then and this past year, of course, social, social service law 363-D um, were recently updated uh, in April um, this year. Next slide. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to highlight, and this is where it's really important to know what, what applies. Um, so, OIG uh, has seven required um, elements of, for effective uh, compliance programs. New York State Office of Medicaid Inspector General has eight. We added that whistleblower um, element. But for long-term care facilities, depending on your size, it, really, it, it, it changes. So, there are eight elements for organizations with less than five facilities. 11 required elements for organizations with five or more facilities. Um, and then CMS and state survey agencies, you know, now have the federal FTAG uh, requirements um, in terms of um, looking at effective compliance programs and whether or not those are maintained. Next slide. So many of you know that as part of uh, OMEGA legislation, um, social service law 30. 363D requires that Medicaid providers adopt and implement a compliance program to detect and prevent fraud and waste and abuse um, in the Medi in Medicaid program. And Title 18 of the New York Code rule and uh, Rules and Regulations in Part 521 specifically defines um, what those requirements are in order to demonstrate that you are ma maintaining an effective compliance program. So let's take a look at what those, uh, what those are. Next slide. Okay, let me provide a compliance program. So who is required uh, to have a compliance program? So providers receiving or claiming $500,000 or more over a 12 month period are required to have a compliance program. Your article 16 and 28 and 31 clinics and the billing companies that they use associated with the provider are required to have compliance programs in place. Um, and each year, providers are required to attest that they meet the requirements um, and, you know, by completing the, certificate, uh, the certification statement for provider billing Medicaid form, and then it's got to be notarized and then, you know, mailed back. Um, previously, um, we were, were required to certify your compliance program online on the OMIG website and complete a, a separate uh, Deficit Reduction Act uh, certification. And that's no longer required. That was typically done every year on an annual basis between December 1st and December 31st. That's all been sort of uh, captured uh, by completing the uh, certification statement uh, for provider billing Medicaid. Um, the cost for not having uh, an effective compliance program in place, you know, you can be excluded from participation, um, you know, in the Medicaid uh, program. Next slide. So this is just basically just a reminder um, about uh, compliance programs, and they have to apply to some of these listed uh, risk areas. So billing, payment, um, you know, medical necessity, um, quality of care, um, all the way on down to, and it's an interesting we, we bolded area, sort of a, a catch-all category. Um, these are other risk areas that are or should, with due diligence, um, you know, be identified by by you, the provider, um, and ensuring that you're that you are uh, conducting risk assessments. You know, that that's how you'd want to, to to identify what are those risk areas for your particular uh, type program type for your, your in, within your particular industry, um, and then use those results when you're creating your annual compliance work plan. Use the results of your risk assessments when developing your audit schedule. So those, those two elements really um, uh, sort of guide your compliance activities for the year. Next slide. And so these are the eight required elements uh, 
according to part 521, right? The OMIG uh, regulations. Um, I'm not going to go into each one of these eight elements. That's, that's a separate uh, training session. Uh, but I, I, I did want to just uh, highlight a couple of points. So element one, having a formal, formally written policies and procedures and your code of conduct, uh, code of ethics. Um, some of the issues that I've seen with some of the written policies and procedures are you know, sol solely having a policy statement and then, and then unfortunately lacking the procedural steps to help guide uh, people's conduct and activity. Um, there are some, some companies that have wonderfully uh, stated um, processes in place, you know, when we have a conversation about their processes, and unfortunately, it's not captured in a formally written policy and procedure, so that, that's problematic. Um, there are some policies and procedures that are very robust and very detailed, but they're not followed in practice, and they really are going to be held accountable to that, for that. Um, given the evolving telehealth requirements, it's, it's imperative that you develop and review and update your policies and procedures regularly. I have seen some uh, organizations where policy and procedure hasn't been looked at or updated or revised in 20, 2009, 2011. So it's been years since they, they've even looked at it. Um, so you really want to involve your compliance committee and your board in ensuring that they're reviewing those uh, compliance um, uh, policies, particularly in telehealth, with all the changes that are happening, uh, and that the board reviews and approves and finalizes them. Uh, for element three, training and, edu and, and education, we're really looking at um, um, just ensuring that the compliance-related um, information is shared with uh, with, their, with all of the entities. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, element number two, that compliance program oversight. Um, it's demonstrated in, in, that it is demonstrated and documented in committee meetings and in board meetings that, act, that compliance activities are reported in to, at those committee meetings and discussed. Um, element four just speaks to having an effective me mechanism for anonymous reporting. So if you, if you have a compliance hotline and the caller ID is, is listed on there, that, that's not an effective me mechanism for anonymous reporting. Um, five, enforcement. You know, really it's asking about what is the process that you have in place to ensure that people are complying with your, uh, with the elements of your compliance program? And is everyone aware of what the consequences are for non-compliant uh, behavior? Uh, number six really is about identifying risk. And so, again, it's imperative to conduct your organization-wide uh, risk assessments, um, share those results, and include them in your annual work plan and in your audit schedule. For element seven, how are those compliance concerns when they are brought forward, how are they responded to? Are they investigated? Are you keeping a log of the investigation? What then happens after the investigation? Um, what sort of corrective measures are you putting in place to ensure that none of those issues uh, resurface? Um, and the um, last element, number eight, um, non-intimidation and uh, non-retaliation. So non-retaliation you know, sort of is met with um, some, some folks that have, have put together policies and procedures regarding whistleblower uh, protections and provisions. Um, what sometimes is missed is information on non-intimidation. The, the really good policies and procedures that I've seen on non-intimidation and, and non-retaliation and the practices that I've seen uh, often talked about throughout the year during training, um, they define what non-intimidation looks like um, and, and what's, what is not condoned, right? So making sure that you're creating an environment where people feel safe and comfortable bringing, bringing things forward. And the non-retaliation is sort of what happens after something is reported. You know, are people um, you know, uh, uh, harassed or um, you know, penalized for bringing, bringing things forward? That's just a quick review of the, the eight elements. So let's, let's look at what, what has changed. Next slide, please. Um, so the amendments to the New York State uh, Social Service Law um, you know, it was approved in April, uh, on April 1st in 2020. It's, it's effective April 1st, 2020, and the fines and penalties are effective January 1st, uh, 2021. So let's look at what's changed. So some key changes. 
so managed care companies and managed, managed um, long-term care companies were added to the list of entities required to adopt and to maintain an effective compliance program. Um, having a compliance program that meets the requirements in the law is, you know, a condition of payment uh, for, for, from the Medicaid assistance program. Um, creation of a compliance committee, which in the past was optional, is now required. Um, and this, this makes total sense. Um, you know, compliance officer in some agencies, they're a one person show um, and they just cannot do it alone. And you really need the help of a compliance committee. And an effective compliance committee is one that um, has membership from across, um, you know, across departments within your organization. Um, so organizations uh, that, that I'm familiar with have adopted a compliance committee charter. Um, where it defines the purpose of the compliance committee, the mission of the, of the compliance committee, it talks about the membership roles and responsibilities, um, the frequency of meetings, um, you know, meeting once a year isn't enough. Um, quarterly, you know, may work for some. And there are some agencies that their compliance committee meets on a monthly basis, and that's ideal. Um, so it really depends on the, you know, the resources that you have and uh, some of the issues that, that you, you are monitoring. Next slide. Um, how are we doing on time, John? We got four minutes. Okay. Um, so other key changes. Um, previously, the, the the compliance officer had to be an employee of the organization. We look at those W two forms to ensure that they're they're a hired employee. That's no longer required. Meaning an outside party or a consultant can operate as a compliance officer. Um, it does indicate that the compliance officer is to report directly to the chief executive or other senior management. Um, what's not defined within the law is the last bullet, and this kind of pertains more to health homes, is that the line of confidential communication has to also extend to first tier and uh, downstream related entities. Um, next slide. It's required um, that both internal and auditing and monitoring activities, as well as um, audits conducted by external entities are, are happening to ensure your overall effectiveness. So with internal auditing and monitoring, really we're looking to see that all processes, not just service documentation and support of the claim, are being looked at. Um, let's see, uh, compliance training and education, you know, at new employee training and orientation um, there and annually thereafter. Um, you know, there's a list of all of the things that need to be trained. It's not just what the regulation states, but it's also the information that uh, employees need to have to support and, and actively engage and participate in good faith of reporting of compliance issues. Next slide. I'm just going to run through these a little quicker. Um, and to put some teeth into the uh, regulation, they significantly up the fines, right? So starting in, in, in January, January 1st, the first offense will be $5,000 per month um, for up to 12 months for not having an effective compliance program in place. Subsequent offenses are, will jump up to fines of $10,000 per month. I think we have a poll question coming up. Yep, last question. Um, organizations are required to designate a compliance committee who reports directly and are accountable to the chief executive officer. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. So oh, COVID implications for compliance programs, um, you know, should not be put on pause at this time, kind of sort of more in overdrive, really looking and checking constantly um, OIG work plans, constantly, um, you, making sure that you're aware of the changes that are happening. Uh, critical, um, you know, conducting your risk assessment, I, you know, I can't emphasize this enough, is a, is a critical component of an effective compliance program. There are so many changes given the pandemic, so it's really important to ensure that you and your team um, seek to identify and mitigate the risks that are re related to, um, you know, telehealth and implementing those services. Um, include your compliance department, include the compliance committee members, include the board in, in some of those discussions and planning meetings. Um, identify what type of auditing and monitoring and reporting activity 
uh, is going to need to be developed and implemented as part of um, you know, in, uh, adopting and maintaining an, uh, an effective compliance com com compliance program. Um, so what's next? Um, right now, OMEG is you know is uh, is to update their Title 18 Part 525, given the, the change in the regulation the regulation to fit uh, the standards of, of social service law changes. Um, they're more, most likely going to put that out for public uh, comments. You know, they've, they've told us it will happen soon. We had expected it to happen in, in the fall, but I think it's going to be pushed out uh, to sometime January, February. So hopefully it'll happen soon. So if you are planning to do a massive overhaul of your compliance program and policies and procedures, I mean, we, we'd caution to, you know, possibly, you know, pause that a, a bit. Um, and, and see what the uh, what the regulations, um, the, the compliance program requirements requirements will be. Um, so that that sort of concludes my piece. If there are any questions, I can. Answer. No questions came in on the chat. Um, we did have a question in the earlier session. That person I'll respond to uh, directly as it was a specific and a technical question. So what we're going to do right now is we're all going to take about a 15 minute break to stretch our legs, maybe get a little bit of food and drink in us, and then we're going to have breakout sessions because some of the accounting uh, requirements are different between hospitals and, and the FQHCs. So for some of you, I'll see you in 15 minutes. For the others, thank you very much for joining you and hope you enjoy uh, Karen and Bettina's presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>